Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. Hi, this is Kurt Repencheck, your host at National Parks Traveler. We were able to share some great news last week regarding national parks and protected areas. Topping the list of great news was the story from Yellowstone National Park, where tens of millions of dollars will be invested in upgrading housing for park employees. It's housing that is sorely needed. We also provided an overview of the things to think about when you motor your RV into a national park. And we broke the story about how Interior Secretary David Bernhardt created a $165,000 a year job for P. Daniel Smith, a former deputy director of the National Park Service. The job, by the way, just happens to be in Smith's hometown in North Carolina. You can find those and other stories about national parks and protected areas at nationalparkstraveler.org. In recent years, there has been a movement of sorts to rebrand units of the national park system as national parks, a movement motivated in large part by the economic boost such a redesignation is hoped to have for the local community. Well, in New Mexico, there's a group that's opposed to turning Bandelier National Monument into Bandelier National Park and Preserve. In a moment, we'll discuss that issue with Tom Reby, Executive Director of Caldera Action, a nonprofit advocacy group in New Mexico. But first, we're continuing our series on how the health of the Colorado River impacts Canyonlands National Park and Glen Canyon National Recreation Area in Utah. To get a better understanding of the river economics in play, I reached out to Megan Lawson, an economist with Headwaters Economics. Our conversation is coming up next. Finally, if you didn't get a chance to read Rene Agredano's story on negotiating national parks in your RV, sit back and listen to it a little later in the podcast. As the Colorado River flows through Canyonlands National Park and down to Glen Canyon National Recreation Area, it literally floats an economic pulse for those parks in their gateway communities. But how much of a boost does the river provide, and how does its relative health, its reliable flows, the invasive species that are brought to its shores, impact those parks and gateway towns? To get a sense of the river's economic impact, we're joined by Megan Lawson, an economist with Headwaters Economics, an independent nonprofit research group from Bozeman, Montana, that works to improve community development and land management decisions. Welcome, Megan. Thanks, Kurt. Thanks for having me. Now, Headwaters often produces research that points to the benefits of tourism um, to rural economies. Overall, how do communities with national parks in their backyards fare economically? Well, when we look on average, um, the communities that have national parks nearby tend to get a lot of benefits from those national parks, from visitors coming through there, um, you know, from staying in hotels, from hiring guide services, and sort of the traditional uh, tourism model of economic development. Um, but then what we're also seeing is that people might visit national parks and their gateway communities as tourists fall in love with the area and figure out a way to move there. So we're also seeing um, that particularly since the last recession, places with those outdoor recreation economies like National Park Gateway Towns have grown faster um, than places without those kinds of natural amenities. Now, back in January of 2019, um, you produced a report that said that recreation counties, to, to use a descriptor, attract new residents and higher incomes. But that's not entirely the case for Grand County, Utah, which is home to Arches and Canyonlands National Parks, is it? Right. And that has, um, you know, like I said, we're, we operate on averages. So on average, that was true that we found that people are moving to recreation counties more quickly. But you're right, in Grand County, the folks moving in um, do not have higher income than the people who are already living there. And in most recreation counties, we're seeing faster growth in earnings per job, but we're also not seeing that in Grand County. 
And so it's not entirely clear uh, exactly why that's happening. You know, I think, uh, you know, part of it might be um, related to the types of folks who are moving in. We know that kind of over that similar time period, the main growth in population for Grand County has been in retirees, but also kind of a younger, younger working age uh, folks, kind of in that 18 to mid 30s range. Your 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 river rats and um, yeah. your your mountain bike guides. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so those folks might be working more seasonal jobs, multiple jobs, um, and kind of willing to take that um, the income hit in exchange for the lifestyle. But at the same time, as you mentioned, um, retirees often look to these um, these settings. Um, I know I'm looking at those settings for retirement and they, they, they help the tax base as well, don't they? They do. They certainly do. And what we do see in Moab, um, one really interesting thing that you can see in the data is that one of the challenges of a recreation economy is the affordability, particularly for housing affordability for folks who are living in these gateway communities. And when you look at homeowners, they really aren't, um, the expenses for homeownership are on par with household income. So it's not particularly unaffordable for homeowners. Um, it looks very similar to the rest of rural Utah. <laughs> but when we look at renters, um, it's a completely different story. And almost half of renters are dealing with unaffordable housing. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's much higher than the rest of rural Utah. Um, so to me, that says that the folks who are moving there, um, like the retirees, they're not dealing with unaffordable housing, but it's the likely the younger folks who are, um, like you said, the river rats and the mountain bike guides um, who are renting homes and working seasonal, seasonal jobs that are facing serious challenges. Sure, sure. Now, if if you follow the Colorado River further south, um, down to Page, Arizona, uh, the headquarters for Glen Canyon National Recreation Area there in um, Coconino County, Arizona, they've fared a little bit better um, in terms of uh, household incomes, no? Yeah, they have. um, The folks moving in um, still are have a lower average um, income when they move in, and they're uh, the rate of folks moving in has been a little slower than in Moab, but you've seen stronger growth in earnings per job. So they might be um, attracting folks. Uh, you know, when we see people moving into recreation counties, um, sometimes it's to follow these seasonal jobs, and sometimes it's folks who um, move there and move their business, um, or they might be freelancers or entrepreneurs. Um, so Coconino might be capitalizing on that. Now, a large draw of Canyonlands and Glen Canyon, of course, is the Colorado River and Lake Powell. Could you hazard a guess on how the health of that river, you know, clean flowing, reliable snowmelt that keeps it, uh, uh, so to speak, on a whitewater rafters bucket list, how the health of that river impacts the local economies there? Yeah, well, I don't, I don't know of any studies directly, there likely are some out there that directly link uh, the quality of the river experience, whether that's measured, like you said, in flows, um, water quality, and those kinds of measures um, to how much people enjoy their experience and how much they're willing to pay to visit that area, to hire the guides, um, to hire the outfitters. Um, And so we know that the higher, the higher quality of the experience, um, the more likely people are going to come and visit, the more likely they're going to come and spend their money in hotels and restaurants and contribute to, you know, the lodging taxes um, that support infrastructure in these communities. Now, I know um, if you look at Lake Powell specifically, it has a, a large problem with invasive quagga mussels and zebra mussels, I believe. And in recent years with the drought, the, um, the level of the, the reservoir there has fallen and exposed these uh, um, bathtub rings, if you will, 
on the surrounding red rock and really exposed a lot of the, the quagga mussels. And, and there's been a lot of uh, mussel shells uh, on the beaches where houseboaters or jet skiers or, or even kayakers would would go to take a break from being out on the water. And, you know, I've been told from um, Park Service personnel that, or, or from state, state of Utah personnel, that those large amounts of shells are really turning people off because, you know, it, it's rough on the feet. And I'm just wondering, you know, again, you know, negative impacts associated with climate change and invasive species there at Lake Powell, how great of a problem that could be down the road. Yeah, and that could be significant because we do have such a kind of a footloose recreation economy. Um, you know, and just in terms of people will follow the high quality resources. And so if they're discouraged by, you know, the aesthetics of the bathtub rings or discomfort of walking on mussel shells, um, you know, then folks are going to move to a different place that that doesn't have those things and has those amenities that they're looking for. So there could be a significant impact on those local uh, houseboat rentals and jet ski rentals and those kinds of things. Yeah, no, and it is quite a, a problem at Lake Powell. Um, the, the process of getting one's watercraft uh, disinfected, if you will. Um, I know in the past that they've had lines, I believe I was told, you know, three or four hour waits to get your boat um, disinfected before and after um, you you enter the reservoir They've improved on that time time lapse, but but still, it's it's something that um, some people might look at that and say, "I'm not even going to bother because of the weight I have to go through to get disinfected, or because of the the prospect of infecting my watercraft with um, with quagga mussels." I know I've got sea kayaks and canoes, so I don't worry too much about that because they're easily removed. But somebody with a, an inboard outboard engine, for instance, um, those mussels can really gum up the the inner works, and so. I think that'll be something to watch going forward is how much of an impact that has on on the um, the watercraft recreation there at Lake Powell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that would be a, a significant deterrent to people coming. Um, and if there's a, a place that meets their needs and doesn't have those challenges and is still you know, a reasonable travel distance away, um, you'll really see recreation shifting around. And that's something even just backing up a little more just recreation in general with, you know, we're anticipating a lot of impacts from climate change with people shifting, you know, where they go ski and what seasons they ski and um, kind of what they do in the shoulder season. So we're not yet certain what that's going to look like, but we do know that there's going to be a big shift both in terms of location and also in terms of timing of when uh, people are recreating. Absolutely. I know that the Park Service has some concerns that um, with, with climate change, the, the seasons, the shoulder seasons are, are getting shorter and, and the, the main season is getting longer. And so they're seeing more people showing up in some instances. And um, with the Colorado River, as, as flows decline, um, I've heard that uh, towards the end of uh, Cataract Canyon in Canyonlands National Park, that some rapids that had been buried, so to speak, by the um, construction of Lake uh, of the Glen Canyon Dam, those rapids are starting to reappear, and um, apparently they're pretty, pretty gnarly rapids that uh, would really attract the white water. And so, you know, you you might have more interest in running Cataract Canyon because of the uh, reappearance of some of these rapids, and you've got you know potentially longer seasons that that all has an impact on on the natural resources and, and, and economically, I, I imagine on one hand, you've got, you could have more demand for recreational services. And yet with um, an agency like the, the park service, which relies greatly on seasonal staff, they may not have the dollars to hire that seasonal staff to meet the longer seasons. And so you've got a, a managerial problem on that aspect. Yeah, exactly. There, and there's a lot of, um, and there's also the whole question of how much, uh, you know, gate revenues meet um, for folks coming into those national parks, if those are enough to meet the challenges of, like you said, staffing kind of out of season um, because their seasonal employees have exceeded, you know, their annual maximum number of hours. Yeah, there's a, a lot of thorny issues that we're just starting to 
um, just starting to see. Yeah, definitely something to keep an eye out uh, in the years ahead. We've been talking today with Megan Lawson, an economist with Headwaters Economics, an independent nonprofit research firm from Bozeman, Montana, that works to improve community development and land management decisions and has really focused a lot of its research on rural economies and uh, economies around national parks and their gateway towns. Thanks so much for joining us today, Megan. Thanks for having me. This podcast is part of a series of articles on the Colorado River and its impacts on national parks in Utah. It was supported by a grant from the Water Desk, an independent journalism initiative based at the University of Colorado Boulder's Center for Environmental Journalism. Listener and reader support make National Parks Traveler possible every day of the year. If you enjoy the Traveler's content, please consider a donation via nationalparkstraveler.org. The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences that it offers endure for generations to come. You can show your appreciation at brpfoundation.org. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It's also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That's why Friends of Acadia exists. Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. You can make a difference at friendsofacadia.org. RV Share provides not only an option for renters to enjoy the perks of RV travel without having to buy one, but an opportunity for owners to earn income by renting theirs out. You'll find everything from large and luxurious Class A RVs all the way to small and easy-to-tow pop-up campers. You can even use their filters to find an RV that is dog-friendly or one that will be delivered right to your campground. Visit RVShare.com to start your search for the perfect RV rental or to list your RV. There has been a movement in recent years to rebrand some units of the national park system. For instance, Pinnacles National Monument, White Sands National Monument, the Jefferson National Expansion Memorial, and Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore all have been redesignated as national parks in recent years. A similar effort has been voiced for New River Gorge National River. Is it a good idea? Is it solely being driven by the lure of dollars to a national park site? In New Mexico, the state's U.S. Senators have introduced legislation to turn Bandelier National Monument into Bandelier National Park. But not everyone thinks it's a great idea. Among those opposed to the renaming is Caldera Action, a nonprofit group in New Mexico that is focused on protection, access, and education on National Park Service lands. To understand their opposition, Tom Reby, the organization's executive director, joins us. Welcome to The Traveler, Tom. Thanks for having me. That's great. Now, update us on this effort, Tom. When, when did it begin, and when did the senators introduce the legislation to change the monument's designation? There has been an effort over the last uh, five years or so by some in the hunting community to try and get hunting started in Bandelier National Monument. Right now, the the monument is a, a thirty, roughly thirty four thousand acre park, and it has no hunting or trapping allowed anywhere in it. Yet, there's been some pressure over the last few years to open the park up to to hunting. And this is something that Senator Heinrich is interested in because he himself is a hunter and has a lot of ties to uh, organizations that that promote hunting. And he had floated the idea about, oh, three, four years ago of, of opening the entire uh, monument up to hunting. And that didn't fly with a lot of People, I think a lot of people that were politically connected back during the Obama years especially, 
And so more recently, within the last uh, seven or eight months, he introduced a new bill, a new national park uh, bill for Bandelier National Monument. And what it does is it would open up the upper elevations of the park to hunting, so about 4,300 acres to hunting. So that seems to have achieved that goal for him. It's got other things that it tries to do too. But anyway, hunting seemed to be the thing that started this process. Uh, Of course, there was unease among a lot of people because of the uh, efforts by the Trump people to undo national monuments around the country. And of course, anybody who had a national monument that they loved started to get worried uh, back in the early Trump years. Mm -hmm. Um, So that was something that, another thing that Senator Heinrich mentioned when he was suggesting that we should redesignate uh, Bandelier National Park. What what's the hunting? Is it is it uh, mule deer, elk? Right, it's uh, mostly um, mostly elk. We have a big elk population. The deal is that um, Bandelier National Monument right now it it uh, adjoins and has a, a common boundary with the Valles Caldera National Preserve. Mm-hmm. The Valles Caldera National Preserve was a piece of private land that was purchased in two thousand for about. 14 years, it was managed by a trust experiment that didn't work very well, and Senator Heinrich and Senator Udall successfully got it um, moved to the National Park Service as a national preserve Mm -hmm. back in 2015. Now, what happened with that was there was language in the the Vice Caldera National Preserve Bill that allowed hunting and trapping. We didn't, none of us wanted trapping. The Park Service didn't want trapping. I don't know how that got in there, but in any case, the hunting language in the Valles Caldera National Preserve Act uh, allows for hunting and trapping, and that was fine. We had uh, worked very hard to get the Valles Caldera National Preserve into the national park system, and we had realized that hunting was a necessity in order to succeed in doing that. Mm-hmm. So we have no problem with hunting. Now, what the reason this is relevant is in the new Bandelier National Park legislation that was written by Senator Martin Heinrich, who really is a champion of public lands, I should say. Uh, he he references the Valles Caldera National Preserve's hunting languages and moves it over into the Bandelier National Park Bill. Uh-huh. So that would be the operating uh, hunting language for the very upper end of Bandelier National Monument. Now, this gets gets into the weeds here. What he would do is he would create a national preserve, a Bandelier National Preserve, over this 4,300 acres in the upper elevations of the park. So that's the place that he wants to open up to hunting using the language from the Valles Caldera National Preserve or organic legislation. So that's, that's where we are. And that, that would allow for tra- trapping and hunting. And I actually don't think that, that Martin Heinrich is interested in having trapping in there, but for some reason that word is in the legislation for uh, the upper end of Bandelier and for the Valles Caldera National Preserve. Yeah. Now you say it's in the upper elevations of the monument. Um, does that mean that if this legislation um, somehow um, gained approval that uh, hunters would be driving through the national park to get to the hunting ground and then carting their um, kills down through the national park again? Yeah, well, it's it's kind of funny because there is um, there is a road of uh a Forest Service road that goes through a big piece of this land that would be open for hunting. And so there would be no problem with access. There's a couple of Forest Service roads that are close to the boundaries and actually go through the the, um, the, the current National Monument at the very upper edge there. So hunters would have no problem having uh, motor vehicle access to their, to their kills, getting pretty close to their kills up there. Mm-hmm. Am I correct in that this legislation would take those 4,300 acres away from the National Park Service and give them to the state of New Mexico? No, it's not quite like that. What would happen is the the Park Service would maintain ownership of the lands, but the the New Mexico Game and Fish Department would have regulatory authority over the game hunting up there. So they would they would have jurisdiction over the hunting rules. Now, that's the way it is in the Valles Caldera National Preserve also. But what they do up there, the Park Service is able to 
set some limits and some um, make some strong suggestions to the state about what they'd like to have happen or not happen with hunting. But out of econ- out of a political necessity, uh, they uh, defer to the state for this. That's what the hunters like. Mm-hmm. And the state, um, New Me- the New Mexico Game and Fish Department, tends to be mostly an okay agency there. Uh, when we have a conservative governor, they tend to be a very conservative agency. Right now we have a Democratic governor, and they are not as um, as uh, hardcore hunting as they are at other times. So it just goes back and forth, and it's unpredictable. That There's a commission, the New Mexico State Game Commission, that, that governs them, and that's where the governor, governor's influence is. So in any case... We're um, what we're really worried about. What Calder Action is worried about is the possibility of predator hunting, uh, you know, for bear um, and some of the other large predators up there, mountain lions, coyotes, that kind of thing that we don't want to see in the park. Right now, we're happy to not have any hunting at all in Bandelier National Monument because it's a little refuge. It's a little island of. of of uh, 35,000 acres that are free of hunting right now. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, along with uh, opposing um, the renaming aspect of this legislation as well as the the hunting portion, um, your organization also wants Congress to do something about the maintenance backlog across the park system. Is that right? Right. That's what really struck us is that that we are very close with the management at Bandelier National Monument and also at the Vice Caldera National Preserve. We know the superintendents well. We know some of the staff quite well, and we we keep track of what their plans are and what their um, maintenance efforts are and what their funding levels are, all these sorts of things. So we've got a more intimate relationship than a lot of organizations may have with, say, a bigger park like Yellowstone or something. We're able to keep pretty good track of what's going on. And the the agency has really been uh, struggling to maintain the place given the ever-decreasing budgets that are coming out of Washington. Mm -hmm. And they have tried to get repaving done of their trails that right now they have a a grossly inadequate, uh, you know, restroom system for uh, about 210,000 visitors a year who come through Bandelier National Monument. And so they they really struggle to to keep the the whole thing going for the level of visitation they have. And the other problem, of course, is that there are there, the number of, of rangers that are available for interpretation and law enforcement and that kind of thing is always sort of bare bones. Um, I think that's true in all the parks now, mm-hmm. and it's yeah. it's very difficult for the public to come there and they want to get a ranger walk. There's very few ranger walks anymore because there's so little staff. Anyway, it's just that kind of thing. And it just seems to me that if the senators want to load more public in there, which is would be the purpose of renaming the park, if you rename it from a national monument to a national park, it's going to get on the list of a lot of people who are all uh, seeking out national parks. And of course, that's wonderful that we have people that are interested in that. But the question is, is the park, um, both staff and facilities, able to handle an increase in visitation? And that's that's where we we differ. We would like to see more staffing for sure, and um, money put into um, fixing up the infrastructure to the point where it could could protect the resources. Yeah, have the senators talked about that? I mean, have they discussed that, uh, yeah, if we pass this legislation, we'll go to the Appropriations Committee and make sure that they uh, add an extra couple million dollars a year onto Bandelier's budget? I haven't heard anything like that. I would say, to their credit, the both Senator Udall, Senator Tom Udall, who's our, our senator who's retiring right now, has been very good about getting money, and also Senator Heinrich as well. But Senator Udall's been in a, in a better senior position in the Senate to get money for the Vice Caldera National Preserve. And they've done very well at keeping the funding up for them as they, it's a new park, it's just joined the park system in 2015, so they've got a lot of expenses and a lot of things needed to be done, but um, they've done well at, at funding that. So I think they're they're fully capable of, of bumping up the budget for 
bandolier. I have not heard them say that they would or wouldn't. Our current campaign that we're uh, launching to sort of oppose the Bandelier National Park Bill, which seems counterintuitive to a group that's a pro-National Park Service organization. Anyway, our current effort is really to, just to highlight this issue of um, budget and facility shortfalls uh, relative to uh, the place being promoted as an economic driver, as, an, as a local economic resource for business in the in the region. Yeah, it's definitely a, a tough issue that the Park Service is up against. Um, we just had news uh, this week, this past week, that uh, Yellowstone was able to get tens of millions of dollars um, promised from Interior to um, upgrade their employee housing, which is certainly... Um, very much needed, but the question arises, you know, if Yellowstone can do it, what about places that aren't named Yellowstone? How successful will they be in seeing their budgets uh, increased um, to address some of the issues that they face? Um, it's certainly a, a dire situation across the national park system, not just the Yellowstones or the, the Bandoliers. Um, going back to Valles Caldera for a second, what type of hunting pressure does it see? Is it uh, a popular hunting grounds? Yeah, it's kind of interesting because the Valles Caldera was a private ranch all the way up until 2000 when it was purchased with land and water conservation funds and made into a, a national preserve. And before then, it was one of the most sought-after trophy elk hunting places in the Southwest because it was, you know, it was private land. And people loved to go in there. Now, after it was from 2000 to 2015, it was managed by this trust organization, mm -hmm. which I won't or listeners with the details on that, but they were promoting hunting as much as they could as a way to make money because they were charged by Congress with making money. Yeah. So they, they pushed hunting pretty hard. Now it's got people love to go in there and hunt elk. There's a nice big elk herd in there, and people are often successful. There's about 5,000 elk in the Vice Caldera and it's a it's about a ninety thousand acre piece of federal land, and it's almost entirely surrounded by uh, U.S. Forest Service land, the Santa Fe National Forest. So there's plenty of um, movement of elk around the region. Bandelier, it used to be back before the climate warmed so much that a lot of elk would spend the summer in the high country up in the Valles Caldera, and then during the winter time, when the snows got deep, they would move down into Bandelier National Monument and also into nearby Los Alamos National Laboratory lands in winter down in the lower country. And that used to really hammer Bandelier National Monument. It used to really, there was a lot of elk, and they were running around, they were trampling the the cultural resources there, which are the reason the park exists, is for mm -hmm. cultural resource protection. Yeah. So there was a big push in the old days for to get the elk numbers down because of this um, this seasonal migration. And that's really stopped now. We're seeing the elk stay up in the high country pretty much year-round now because of the fact that the snow levels are much lower than they used to be. Mm -hmm. Now, the other day, um, your organization um, sent the senators a, a letter asking them to uh, basically stop what they're doing. Have you had any um, response from them? Are they willing to discuss the issues with you and, and possibly revise their legislation? I haven't heard from them since our letter went out, and I know that the the uh, press release that we put out with the letter got picked up by the Associated Press, and so it's gotten they spread things around pretty well. And I haven't I haven't heard back from the the senators yet. I don't know if they're going to call me up and say, "Well, let's negotiate." I can't. I don't have any illusion that our little tiny organization has got a whole lot of clout. But I, I thought I would raise the issues this way and, and get the conversation started about these things. When I talked to Senator Heinrich's aides about three months ago, they said that they called the Bandelier Bill a work in progress, and they said that it was not set in stone with its current language. So that gives us optimism that things can be adjusted to, to handle the concerns we have. It's such a uh, such a funny thing because they're really just trying to open up a little bit of the of the monument to hunting and and that that's uh, not as simple as if they were trying to open up the whole thing to hunting. Yeah, yeah. But it's it's enough to you know what was weird is is way back when when the Valles Caldera area the Bach was the Baca Ranch. 
Right. There was this big chunk of it that came over the rim of the um, uh, caldera and came down into what's now Upper Bandelier. And that piece of land was purchased by the federal government back in 1977, and that piece was added onto Bandelier National Monument. So this is the really the upper elevations. We're talking about eight to 11,000 foot wow. elevation levels. And so that's the piece that we're talking about here. It's what we always call the new acquisition. So this is the piece up there that they want to put the hunting in, is that little piece that was sort of, it used to be part of the Baca Ranch uh, long ago. But anyway, it's got this, this strange history. And the other thing that's interesting about Bandelier is, you know, when Edgar Lee Hewitt was pushing for the Antiquities Act back at the turn of the century, he was, he was really concerned about Bandelier what's now Bandelier Land, particularly, and Chaco Canyon, because those were the two places that he was watching get plundered by all these pot hunters. And a lot of them were museums and people from the east who were just coming out and taking pots out of the, digging the ruins up and taking pots and whatever else they could find, probably some skeletons and things like that. Mm -hmm. So he pushed for the passage of the Antiquities Act, and apparently he helped write it. And I, he he spent a tremendous amount of time in, in Bandelier, and he mapped Bandelier. He didn't excavate there. He excavated over at Puye Cliffs, which is north of Bandelier. But it was really, people need to understand that the the impetus for the Antiquities Act really was Bandelier and Chaco Canyon. I mean, there were other things around the country that fed into this also. Yeah. But that's part of why we... we like to have it stay a national monument just because that's uh, it's got this his very serious historic place in the formation of the Antiquities Act. Would the legislation rename it as a park and preserve? I mean, that's what they normally do when they allow hunting. Yes, it would be a park and preserve like they did at Great Sand Dunes, where you've got they, uh, yeah, where they, the land that's got that's open to hunting is called a preserve, and the right. land that's not is called the national park. So that's that's good. Well, you know, the NPCA, uh, NPCA people are, are worried that we're setting a bad precedent here where we could be decommissioning parts of national parks and allowing other things to go on in them, in this case hunting. And they're worried about that precedent. NPCA is not going to oppose this legislation. They're saying they're, they're expressing concerns and worries about it, but they're not going to oppose it. Huh, why not? Oh, I think they're worried about offending Senator Heinrich. Yeah. You know, and I, I don't I think, you know, it's just like a relationship. It's like a marriage. If you're going to be uh, working with somebody closely, then you need to be able to say, hey, no, 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 this isn't good. Let's not do this. Let's, yeah. let's, let's try again. I know they're concerned about the New River Gorge uh, proposal because that also carries the preserve aspect of it to allow for hunting. Yeah, you know, Senator Heinrich is a hardcore hunter. He he really is. He's, I, I know him pretty well. I've spent quite a bit of time with him. And he is really a hunter. And and he's not a he's not the bad kind of hunter that wants to go out and get trophies and hunt rare animals and that kind of thing. He's he's very aware of wildlife and all kinds of wildlife, all the way down to things like pikas. Hmm. But nevertheless he's really a hunter and he really sees the world through that lens and i think he's got a lot of really good friends who are hunters also and i don't know why they've been wanting to get into bandelier to hunt you know like in the old days it used to be to try and get that impact of the elk in the winter time down but it just i just don't know i don't understand the obsession it's a very small piece of land and it's really not worth all this yeah, well, we'll be watching this, and uh, please uh, keep us informed. We've been talking with Tom Reby, the executive director of Caldera Action, about uh, a legislative effort by New Mexico's two U.S. senators to rename Bandelier National Monument as Bandelier National Park, uh, in large part to allow hunting in the National Monument grounds. Tom, thanks so much for joining us. Yeah, I appreciate it very much. Thanks for your work. Washington State is graced with three spectacular national parks, each different and special in their own unique ways. As the official nonprofit partner and the only philanthropic organization dedicated exclusively to supporting these parks through charitable contributions, 
Washington's National Park Fund has a mission to deepen the public's love for, understanding of, and experiences in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Share your passion for these parks at WNPF.org. The Grand Teton National Park Foundation is a private, nonprofit organization that supports projects that protect and enhance Grand Teton National Park's cultural, historic, and natural resources. By funding initiatives that go beyond what the National Park Service could accomplish on its own, Foundation donors improve the visitor experience and provide benefits to the national park system for decades to come. See their successes at gtnpf.org. Dry Tortugas National Park, 70 miles off the Florida Keys, just very well might be the most difficult park to reach in the lower 48. But when you arrive, you're surrounded by crystalline waters for snorkeling, scuba diving, fishing, and kayaking. There are sunken wrecks to explore, coral reefs swarming with colorful marine life, and history in the brick walls of a Civil War-era fort. The Yankee Freedom 3, departing from Key West, can get you there in a little more than two hours. Visit them at drytortugas.com. The North Cascades Institute has a large portfolio. It's an environmental learning center, a training center, a conference center, and a leadership center all set in the splendor of the North Cascades National Park Complex. Learn more at ncascades.org. Heading out into the national park system via RV is a highly popular way to enjoy the parks. But if you haven't traveled much in the park system in an RV, there are some tips that you need to be aware of. Rene Agredano outlined them in the following story. Baker Creek, that's the one, I said to my traveling partner as he slowed down for the turn. It's that dirt road. He looked at the sharp climb into the forest, then at me, and shook his head. Maybe it wasn't the best national park for an RV like ours after all. Are you sure this is where you want to go? Yes, I said. I was. Or at least I thought so. My cursory trip research gave me the confidence that at least a few of the sites at Great Basin National Park could accommodate our 42-foot-long rig. Three miles later, as we bounced along that bumpy, narrow road into the campground, we were reminded that sometimes spontaneity has a price. The rustic accommodations of National Park campsites get us closer to nature than private campgrounds outside the park but opting for that primitive experience often puts RVers like you and me in the middle of that classic Goldilocks conundrum. Without good planning, we just don't know if a campground can easily accommodate our home on wheels. I can't count the number of times we have spent an entire afternoon jumping from one site to another, trying each one on for size until we found one that fits just right, if we are lucky enough to find one at all. As the owner of a medium-sized fifth wheel, I'm always slightly envious when I see truck campers, vans, and small motorhomes tucked away in a cozy gem of a campsite that could never accommodate my rig. The truth is, bigger is not always better when it comes to RVing in the national parks. The smaller your rig, the more campsite choices you have, including some amazing backcountry campsites where large rigs would never tread. It's often said that the best RV type for national parks is a unit that's 30 feet long or less, including the tow or towed vehicle. I agree, since the short, narrow parking aprons in most national park campgrounds make navigation difficult in anything bigger. That's not to say your 40-foot motorhome won't ever be able to camp in national parks, it just means that you'll need to work harder to find a great campsite. If you're one of America's 9 million RV owners and have your heart set on a national park experience, prepare to reserve a spot as far in advance as possible at recreation.gov. Wherever you roam in the park system, the RV-friendly spots are always the first to go. Spontaneous travel offers some amazing benefits, but showing up at a national park's campground without a reservation is a recipe for disappointment. For example, two years ago we showed up at Yellowstone in October without a reservation 
and learn the hard way that the off-season is a thing of the past. There wasn't a single site open inside the park for an RV our size. Compared to most RVs, ours is pretty small. The fifth wheel itself is only 27 feet long, but when hitched to our pickup truck, it's a 42-foot long rolling home that sometimes makes campsite parking a crazy experiment in communication, patience, and skill. Many owners of RVs larger than ours are successful at squeezing into the pint-sized campsites at national parks, but we prefer to avoid being the afternoon entertainment when we land somewhere. From Joshua Tree to Black Canyon of the Gunnison and beyond, we've learned that planning pays off for a national park RV camping, and it's easier now that we know the answer to these questions. Will the campground accommodate my needs? If your RV is self-contained with holding tanks, toilet facilities, and perhaps solar electric power, you can go just about anywhere. But if you're in a more basic rig without them, a designated campground with water and bathroom facilities is a smart idea. If you rely on generator power, you'll need a campground that allows their use. Not all do in the park system, so always verify that the one you want to visit has generator hours and other creature comforts you want. What is the length of my RV? Don't rely on the RV manufacturer's sticker to tell you the length of your rig. That number usually only factors in the interior length dimension of the RV instead of the exterior measurement from front to back bumper. Your tow vehicle, or towed car, adds additional length that impacts where you can camp. To find out your actual length, get your RV measured. You want to know the total number of feet for your RV and secondary vehicle, if any. If you don't know the length of your rig when you're rolling down the highway, now's the time to grab a surveyor's tape measure and figure it out. Measure from the front bumper of the first vehicle to the back bumper of the second one. If you have bicycles or a cargo box hitched to the rear, add those in too. Also, measure the height from the highest point on your roof and total width with the slides extended, if applicable. Many campsites have thick tree canopies with limited clearance for tall vehicles, and some National Park Campground websites will let you know if they do. What is the maximum RV length for the campsite I want? You'll see that number for every campsite on recreation.gov, and it only refers to the vehicle being parked at the site. To accommodate for turning radius and parking technicalities of various RV styles, many back-end sites will have different length restrictions for trucks, vans, and motorhomes and towables. A towable is typically allowed five fewer feet parking space in a campsite than a motorhome to account for turning radius. If you see that a site has a 35-foot maximum length for a motorhome, the longest fifth wheel it can easily accommodate will probably be 30 feet long. Also, you may or may not be able to fit a second vehicle on the parking apron. Before reserving a spot, call the park to get a better idea of the campground's ease of use for an RV like yours. Do parking hazards exist? Even when site dimensions look acceptable, natural obstacles may prevent you from getting into the spot. If there's any question about getting into a site before you book online, look carefully at recreation.gov photos or download a Google Earth map to confirm that you can fit your vehicle and your RV into that space without scraping a tree or a boulder. If you're already at the campground, observe and note if the rig's back end will hang over the parking apron or smash into neighboring landscaping. Many RVers squeeze into a site that's technically too short for their RV by hanging the rear end off the parking apron. If you're tempted to try it, be aware that staff may or may not look the other way. In the RV community, many people will say that a small RV is best for one location, while a vocal contingent of supersized RV owners will say they don't have a problem accessing the same spot. As with many things, the truth lies somewhere in the middle. In addition to great scenery, our trip to the Baker Creek Campground also had a learning experience in store. We survived the dirt road getting there, but our hopes for a great site disappeared when we discovered that the biggest campsites were already taken. 
The deeper we drove into the campground, the more frustrated we grew after seeing that most sites were just too short for our rig. Finally, we found a spot constructed along an awkwardly curved parking apron, but it had tall trees on either side that warned of disastrous consequences for any RVer dumb enough to park there. With no options left, we were the next victims and quickly acquired a deep pinstripe scratch for a souvenir. Today, it's a constant reminder to do more homework before RVing into any national park. This article was made possible by RVShare.com. That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. Next week, we'll take a peek at an upcoming series of podcasts from San Antonio Mission's National Historical Park in Texas. For The Traveler, this is Kurt Repencheck. See you in the parks. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Park's Travelers podcast. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. National Park's Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit us at nationalparkstraveler.org.